having uh, an impact um, and the um, appearance of, of many cloud uh, platforms where people can actually go in and check things out, um, um, the, the, impact, the impact and the, 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 the significance of, of all of this is becoming more um, real. And so, although this has been going on for many years in the physics departments, specifically with respect to graduate students, um, it is necessary at this point to consider how we can transfer that knowledge to a computer science department where the um, background in maybe probability or math or uh, physics is not as strong as, you know, uh, physics department. So um, the next two presenters are going to be uh, from Indiana University in Bloomington. Um, the first one is uh, Professor Gerardo Ortiz, who is um, leading along with the other presenter, Amr Sabri, uh, the new Center for Quantum Information Science and Engineering in, uh, in Bloomington. Uh, Professor Ortiz has um, taught uh, the uh, quantum computation and quantum information course, the P555, um, for the last um, at least five years. This is a course that's specifically for uh, graduate students in uh, physics, motivated students, and then uh, graduate students in computer science or mathematics can also take the, the course. Um, uh, the, um, the first part of the presentation is about that. So with this, I would like, if possible, for us to welcome Professor Ortiz, who's going to present uh, from classical, the first part of the presentation from classical to quantum computing. So good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Adrian, for putting all this together. So uh, what I'm going to tell you uh, is uh, basically uh, uh, the physics approach uh, to teaching um, quantum information and computation. And this is essentially uh, uh, part of the approach I've been using um, uh, here at Indiana University in the last 15 years, okay? So this course has been delivered for, uh, for some time already. And uh, what I'm going to show you today is basically uh, the emphasis on the uh, intimate connection between the laws of physics and the laws of computation. Okay, so uh, our story starts with Richard Feynman. Okay, in 1981, Richard Feynman is a very well-known uh, uh, theoretical physicist um, uh, that basically made several contributions. And in particular, the story here uh, starts in the keynote speech that he delivered uh, in 1981, where he wanted to know, Richard Feynman asked the following question. He wanted to know uh, if it was possible to better understand physics uh, by using a device that could function as nature, okay? So here it is Richard Feynman. And essentially uh, what, uh, you know, he doubted that quantum physics could be efficiently simulated with, with a classical computer, okay? And the main reason why he doubted about that is that, you know, uh, as far as we know, if you are trying to simulate uh, a quantum phenomena with a classical computer, uh, for example, suppose you would like to understand the superfluid properties of helium-3, okay? So if you want to understand that, the complexity of answering that question scales not with the volume of the helium-3, so suppose you have a bucket of helium-3, but it scales with the exponential of the volume. And this doesn't seem, you know, the way nature works. So essentially he was saying, well, what happens, you know, uh, 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 nature, as far as we know, our best representation is not classical. So what would happen if I use a device that could function as nature? A device that could exploit the laws of quantum mechanics, okay? So that was a very deep question and this is essentially the beginning of this whole story, okay? Now, quantum computation is an abstract paradigm for information processing. And in principle, exploit the laws of quantum mechanics, but it can be implemented independently of the particular uh, 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 device, quantum information processing device that one is using, okay? Uh, let's look at this thing and let's try to think a little bit if there is any relation between physical systems and model of computation. So in principle, on the right-hand side, we have 
you know, physical systems. In principle, this physical system could be a set of electrons, you know, a liquid NMR system where essentially uh, you have control on the nuclear spins of the molecules in the liquid NMR. Uh, or you could have, you know, helium-4 atoms or things like that. And for every single physical system, there is a language, okay? That language essentially is nothing else than some sort of mathematical representation of the degrees of freedom of that particular system. For example, if you have a liquid NMR quantum computer and you have experimental access to the nuclear spins, the nuclear spins, which are in the jargon of physics, is spin one half, it's like a qubit. Okay, so that means that experimentally you have access to a qubit, okay, or to several qubits. So indeed, uh, there is a way of translating from this uh, 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 experimental physical system language to a model of computation that is represented by an operator algebra. So for example, as I mentioned, if you have a liquid NMR uh, system where you have control on the qubits on a spin one half, the essentially the model of computation is going to be related to the model of computation of qubits of a spin one half. And that's a model that we've been hearing in the previous talk, okay? That's one particular model, but in principle, suppose that you could have access and control on electrons. You have a different system and you have control on electrons. Electrons are fermions. And now if you have enough control and you can construct a model of computation that is using the language of fermions, Essentially, you have a computer that is manipulating those degrees of freedom and is as powerful as the other computer that is using qubits, okay? So the whole point of this speech is to say that, in a sense, the laws of computations are the laws of physics, okay? And essentially, what a quantum computer is, is a device that exploits the laws of quantum mechanics as opposed to a classical device that exploits the laws of classical physics. That is what it is in the end, nothing else. So now, you know, during the course, I start explaining essentially what it entails to specify a model of computation. And what I do is I try to relate uh, a model of computation to a physical process because it's very intuitive. One, you understand essentially uh, 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 how to map that model of computation to a physical process is very simple even to design algorithms, okay? So if you think about uh, specifying the model of computation, uh, 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 you have uh, to essentially specify two things, four things, I mean, four steps. One is, what is the state space? The state space, uh, as, I mean, I'm going to give you examples in a minute, but the state space is basically where is you encode information. So if your information is encoded in bits or your information is encoded in qubits. What is the initial state? The initial state is nothing else than the preparation of your qubits or your bits in a particular state. It could be, you know, the string 0000, okay? How states can be manipulated, okay? So how states manipulate, that's a physical process. That's an evolution process where essentially, you know, uh, you uh, touch that initial state and you perform certain operations that, for example, in the language of computer science, it could be that you perform some not uh, 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 gate, but it's not necessarily a not gate. It's any physical process, okay, can be in principle uh, encoded in this evolution. And then the last question is how is that you gain uh, information about that particular evolution, that particular final state? Okay, and that's a measurement. Okay, now this is true regardless of whether this is a classical process or a quantum process. Okay, so if it's a classical process, uh, essentially you have this classical computer and it's doing exactly the same thing that I'm saying here. If it's a quantum computer, it's going to use the laws of quantum mechanics, but it's going to perform exactly the same set of steps. So Let's, for the moment, concentrate on a particular model that is the model that was described in the previous talk. That is the standard digital model of computation or the standard model of computation or the bit model or the quantum bit model if it's quantum, okay? Let's, let's concentrate on that. So it was already explained before, so I can go fast uh, 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 through these slides. 
that the state space in principle is represented in terms of bits. Bits are things that can only be in the state zero or one. And if you have, you know, many bits essentially is a set of strings of zero and ones, okay? Now, if you have uh, a quantum system, uh, uh, a, a quantum system is not a set of strings of zeros of one, but these are essentially linear superpositions of those states, okay? So in a certain sense, it looks uh, from the very beginning that is a much more powerful idea because instead of having a single string of bits, now you have a linear combination, okay, a linear combination of all these strings of bits, okay, multiply in principle with some amplitude, some probability amplitude, these alphas that are written there, uh, uh, that essentially is giving you how much weight of a particular string is in that vector, okay? Now you can ask, okay, how do I prepare my initial state? Okay, so uh, uh, classically, uh, for example, you prepare your initial state by, in this case of three bits, by essentially initializing all the bits to zero, for example, okay? Now, quantum mechanically, you can think exactly in the same way. In principle, you can prepare something that looks like a bit, a string of bits zero, 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 but you also have the possibility of preparing initial states which are superposition, okay? But now, for the sake of the argument, we can simplify and we can think that our initial state is going to be these uh, strings of zeros, okay? Now, the evolution. In the evolution in classical systems, if you have three bits, essentially, you apply uh, uh, all kinds of gates. Like, for example, you can apply, you know, a AND gates, uh, or you can apply control nodes, like we have here, okay, uh, between these different bits. Uh, and we see how this process is evolving. So you see that, for example, you go free here from a string 0, 1, 1 to a string 1, 1, 1 to a string 1, uh, 0, 1 or to a string 1, 0, 1. Okay, so that's the way the information is processed and it's always is going from one string to another string to another string to another string. Now, quantum mechanical is different. As explained before, quantum mechanically, you have the chance essentially uh, 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 to entangle, and I will come back to this concept in a minute, to entangle these bits and what you are evolving, even if you start initially with a state that is a string of zeros, as the system evolves, you see that now the state space is a vector. Now this state space essentially is a linear combination of different possibilities, okay? Now, here is a big difference between classical and quantum, okay? Classically, we do not worry too much about the readout, okay? So classically, if we have at the very end of this evolution process, we have a string one, zero, one, and we try to measure this bit, the first bit, for example, here, if it's a one, I am going to see a one with probability one, okay? So, uh, essentially, there is no need to do any kind of theory of measurement because, I mean, it's deterministic, okay? Now, quantum mechanically is a completely different animal. Quantum mechanically, the measurement is a very, very, very important part of the physical process, okay? Because despite the fact that you can have a linear superposition, when you measure this qubit at the very end, you are not going to measure this quantum superposition, but you will still measure zero or one at the very end with a certain probability. For example, if you have the state zero, zero, zero plus one, 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 if I measure this bit one here, I will get with 50% probability a zero, or I will measure, I will see with 50% probability a one. And if I measure a zero, my state is going to become zero, zero. I mean, the state, the state of the whole system. So if I measure here, zero here, I will measure zero here and zero here. And if I measure one here, I will have one here, one here, and one here. So that's a completely different animal. And moreover, there is something very important that differentiates a classical, 
uh, a measurement from quantum measurement that is called the non-cloning theorem. So the non-cloning theorem is a fundamental thing about quantum reality. The non-cloning theorem, what is telling you is essentially that there is no quantum photo photocopy machine. Okay, so essentially you cannot construct a universal machine that can copy absolutely every single state. Okay, in your, in your space. So now let me go to something that I do with the students. That is, I'm trying to say, okay, what are the fundamental concepts that one can exploit, physical concepts one can exploit in a quantum algorithm? Remember the quantum algorithm is going to be preparation of initial state, some evolution, some measurement, okay? So that's a physical process. And now I will say, what are these concepts? Well, essentially there are three concepts you have to take into account. One is a concept of quantum parallelism uh, uh, and interference that was mentioned in the previous talk. And another one is the concept of entanglement. So the question is how these different evolution processes and measurement essentially can be implemented in a way that you exploit to your advantage all these three different, uh, uh, three, these three different concepts, okay? So let's see a little bit what these things mean, okay? So we saw something in the previous talk, but let me just tell you. So, I mean, the best example of an interfering effect is a wave, it's a wave effect. I mean, interference is not a property of quantum mechanics, period. I mean, sorry, only of quantum mechanics. It's also a property of classical physics, okay? So what this thing means, I mean, in the language, for example, of what is called the two-slit experiment, okay, uh, uh, now transferred to the language of, uh, of algorithm, is that if you have, for example, some superposition of different waves, amplitudes, essentially you can do something with these two slits. For example, here I put certain operation, okay? This operation was mentioned before, it's called a Hadamard, okay? Essentially you can eliminate some elements of this combination by uh, 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 negative interference, by annihilating those particular amplitudes, okay? So this is known also in classical physics. That's not the special of uh, quantum mechanics. So what is, what is uh, quantum parallelism? Well, quantum parallelism is the fact that since now you can have all possible streams at the same time, essentially you can, although you can initialize just with a single string, you can apply certain operations which are quantum mechanical operations, okay? Something that has to do with quantum mechanics and you are going to have all possible inputs at the same time, and whatever evolution operation you do afterwards, you are going to have all the full, uh, uh, essentially, uh, 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 parallel information, for example, about the value of a particular function. And last, and most importantly, is the issue about entanglement, okay? Entanglement is this spooky action at the distance that Einstein didn't like, okay, already in 1935, at the very beginning of quantum mechanics, and this is essentially one key, okay, one key uh, resource that one can use in computation and not only in computation, indeed in quantum sensing and in quantum metrology, what is known now as quantum metrology for precision measurement, okay. So uh, uh, indeed uh, uh, entanglement is key for protocols that do not have a classical counterpart such as quantum teleportation, okay. I'm, and we are going to hear something later on about quantum teleportation too. So now what I do next is, okay, I say, okay, now that we learn all these different physical uh, processes, what I'm going to do is I am going to uh, generate one particular physical process that is known as Deutsch problem. So Deutsch problem is one of these problems that Deutsch introduced uh, in 1985 that essentially started uh, 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 it started uh, the whole field of quantum computation itself, okay? So essentially the question is, uh, you can ask the following question. So you have some certain function, a function from one bit to one bit. And essentially the question is, suppose that you have some black box or some Oracle that can compute this function. And you would like to know out of all possible functions, here I'm putting one function, but it could be many other functions, okay? This is a black box. so. Imagine that there is a function and you ask a question, is this function constant or balanced? Okay, that is the question. So if you are going to do this classically, uh, it turns out that classically it will take for these two bits 
uh, here of this, uh, for sorry, for a one bit function is going to take essentially two calls, okay? But, uh, uh, but if you are essentially using uh, a, a quantum algorithm, uh, you can do it with a single call. So let's see how the physical process evolves. What is going on? So when you see here, what you are using from, from, from the previous uh, 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 concepts I, I was talking about, we start using quantum parallelism. So the first thing we do is to put all possible inputs at the very beginning. Then we apply the function and when we look at the very end, and what we are exploiting is the fact that we are entangling, okay, this information. And at the very end, I mean, when you are at here before even measurement, you use interference. So essentially you entangle things, you use interference, and now with this interference, what depending on what are the, the functions, whether they are uh, constant or they are uh, balanced, this you will have zeros here okay in this linear combination you will have zero so if i measure and i measure a zero that means that the function is constant if i measure and i measure a one the function is balanced so in this ways you can see how these different principles are are working okay and uh, uh later on i said okay this is you know a baby problem so let's try to now come and say well let's look at classes of quantum algorithm Let's look at, uh, you know, uh, algorithms that essentially are exploiting certain parts of quantum mechanics and other algorithms that are exploiting uh, other parts of quantum mechanics. And essentially, as far as we know, there are is basically two classes of algorithm. I mean, these two classes of algorithm, of, co of course, you can, you can solve many problems fall within this category, okay? But these are the classes of phase estimation algorithm. So you estimate a phase in that linear combination. And the other is an amplitude amplification algorithm that where you are, you are doing is essentially amplify one of the components of those linear combinations of strings, okay? So the first essentially uh, uh, was invented by Short, okay? And indeed the main algorithm is known as quantum Fourier transform. And the second one is grower search algorithm and structure search, okay? So these are, uh, so let me show you uh, essentially how these algorithms work as a physical process, okay? Uh, uh, for the case of three qubits, only three qubits. So you don't need to understand exactly what is going on here. So uh, the only thing you need to understand is that you know you have some initial state that essentially represents you know this omega one, omega two, omega three. These are, for example, zeros or ones, each of them. Okay, so it's a bit representation. And what you want to do at the very end is essentially to do the Fourier transform, so to do this linear combination here. Okay, that is represented here in this way. So notice that this linear combination here in the end is nothing else than the product of these vectors. So if you, if you remember what I said about entanglement, you start with an unentangled state here at, as initial state, and you go to an unentangled state at the very end. So the question is, okay, let's see how the state evolves, okay, at different parts of the evolution or the circuit, okay? So if you look here, what is going on, essentially you have, again, a product. If you continue and you continue here, you again have a product. If you continue here, again, you have a product. You continue here, again, you have a product. You continue, again, you have a product. And you continue, again, you have a product. Now you ask a question. Wait a second. If I am looking at this evolution, I am seeing always a product. Where is entanglement? Where is the entanglement that was exploited in this kind of of algorithm that is extremely powerful because this uh, algorithm that is uh, 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 used for factoring prime number, large prime numbers, okay? This algorithm is the basis of RSA, okay? It's the basis of all, you know, all, all, all uh, uh, of the algorithms essentially that are used for any kind of transaction we use in the web. Okay, so I say to the students, fine. So let's try to measure that thing. Okay, let's try to find some quantity that can measure the amount of entanglement that is evolving, okay, along this uh, evolution. 
And I define this quantity. I don't have to explain you know, how I, we came with this, uh, with this quantity, but there is this quantity we call purity. Okay, you can measure. Now for this algorithm, you measure this purity is one, 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 one. And one, one, one means an entangle, that there is no entanglement. So there is absolutely no entanglement. Okay, so what you learn from this is that this, you know, the main part of the factoring of Shor's factoring algorithm is not using entanglement in any possible way. So the only thing is using is interference, okay? Uh, is using interference. So, so I raise a question to the student. I say, okay, if he's using interference, is it possible that we could find some sort of classical wave uh, uh, system that could do exactly the same thing as efficient as Shor's algorithm? I mean, we don't know the answer to that, okay? But that's a fundamental question you can ask to the student. So then you come and you come to Grover's type of search algorithm. And again, you say, okay, what is going on with quantum search algorithm? Again, you don't need to understand what, what the things represent, but in search algorithm, there is some operator here that is called the Grover iterate. And this, I will explain a little bit uh, in a minute. And uh, essentially quantum search is that there is some, uh, you are trying to find, for example, uh, uh, the name of a person uh, 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 that has a certain phone number, okay? So you have a phone number, you're trying to find, you know, a, a needle in a haystack, essentially. So let's look how this algorithm works. Yes, there is quantum parallelism. Yes, we initialize all the initial things at the very beginning, all the initial uh, possible inputs, sorry. Now, I, I'm not showing you here, but all the states which are in the middle are entangled, okay? So and you can calculate using the same quantity I told you before. And then at the very end, what you see is that there is an amplitude amplification. Essentially, the good solution, the solution that you wanted to find, essentially gets amplified, okay, by this number, by this sign of 2k plus 1 theta. And k is the number of times that you apply this iterate. And it turns out that the number of times you apply this iterate is scales with the input size. So remember, n is 2 to the number of bits that you have here is k is at the square root of n. And that's a quadratic speed up of the quantum search algorithm, okay? So this iterate, I continue and I say, so what is this iterate physically? What is the physics behind this iterate? Well, it's not hard to realize that the physics behind this iterate is essentially a Markov process, okay? It's a Markov process where there is diffusion and absorption. And I explain, because some of them, they have already been exposed to Markov processes, I explain uh, essentially what is the diffusion part and the absorption part, and they understand perfectly well why is that this algorithm is working as it's working. Because essentially what the thing is, is you know, the mark element is some sort of potential that has you know, sort of like an impurity potential where essentially the wave function, okay, which uh, you start with a wave function that is uniform everywhere, the wave function accumulates, okay? So that's what the thing is doing, okay? So, uh, okay, I will skip this. Uh, there is a geometric interpretation that is very interesting, okay? Uh, but I will skip that because uh, I'm already, uh, uh, I'm already uh, 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 using my time. And then I start saying, okay, where is the power of quantum computing? Where is that this power is coming from? It's coming from interference phenomena, okay? As I said before, interference phenomena in classical ways, okay? Classical electromagnetism, you have interference, okay? So it's coming from quantum parallelism. It's coming from entanglement. What entanglement? That's another thing that is important. What kind of entanglement is given, if any, okay, uh, uh, the power to computation? Well, it turns out, that there is not an answer to this question either, okay? So it's not well understood where the power is coming, so we know how to use it, but you know what is giving all the power of the things with respect to conventional and classical computation is not completely understood. At this point, you know, I mean, and indeed during the course, I always tell the students to use this IBM quantum computer, okay? Because this is very illuminating. I mean, using a real computer as opposed to using, you know, Mathematica, or any software that essentially is a classical software that is imitating a quantum computer, uh, using a real quantum computer gives you insight, okay? So it gives you insight 
Because if you're trying to implement this in a real computer, like an IBM quantum computer, it turns out not all qubits are equal. Not all qubits are born equal. So therefore, depending which qubits are you using in your computation, you will get a different answer. And indeed, I made them play. I made them play with that thing. And one of the questions I asked them is, can you determine what is the real architecture of the computer, okay, if you start playing with the gates, okay? So that's, that they can derive, it's very interesting. And then they can go and check what is the architecture. You know that IBM, for instance, okay, is, uh, is saying uh, uh, they, they, they have, okay? Now, is that the only thing I'm doing? No, of course, in the course, there are many other things uh, I talk about. I don't have time to, to tell you about those things. Uh, in particular, quantum error correction is fundamental. Okay, quantum error correction is a beautiful theory. It can be explained very easily and is, is key to this whole story. I also explain other models of quantum computation because the standard model is not the only one. Okay, uh, before it was mentioned quantum annealers, indeed this goes under the name of adiabatic quantum computation, but there are other measurement based computation that are also fundamental. And also there is another model of computation that for example, Microsoft is pursuing, okay? It's a little bit more esoteric, okay? Uh, uh, that is called topological quantum computation that is exploiting essentially something that physicists like a lot uh, that is called Majorana Fermions, okay? So that's for, for another, another lecture. Uh, I also uh, talk about quantum communication uh, quantum key distribution, and I spend some time with physical implementation of these devices and also simulations, quantum simulations. So I would stop here. Okay, so I have an idea. Um, I, is it okay with you, Gerardo, if we keep the questions at the end? After oh, we... absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so I would stop sharing. Perfect. So um, Amr and Gerardo have worked together for many years. Uh, um, Gerardo is an expert in physics. Um, Amr is an expert in um, programming languages. They are very familiar with each other's uh, fields. Uh, Amr is going to show you how he is using basically all of this uh, information um, to try to teach at the 400 level in a computer science undergraduate classroom. And here's what I um, am thinking, that the first person who asks a question at the end gets a free book if you want. <laughs> all you have to do is to ask the first question. This book is yours. I have many more though. Okay, so Amr, I uh, think I introduced you. I'm gonna show them um, on the website. Um, this here represents the um, bio for um, Gerardo with his accomplishments. And then um, this is um, the bio for Amr. And um, uh, as, I, as I mentioned in, in the, I said that they're working together. They've been working together for a long time. He proposed the model for quantum computation in 2003 in Haskell. He had a graduate uh, seminar that he taught three, uh, three, three times. And then um, the um, uh, school got an engineering department and the campus got a quantum um, science and engineering center. And now we have a, um, an undergraduate uh, course in uh, uh, quantum computation that Amr is teaching. So. Okay, thank you very much. So now, uh, I mean, something completely different in some sense. I mean, uh, the physics, the theory is wonderful and amazing. Uh, but then, and I try to teach uh, similar courses to graduate students in computer science, and they can handle quite a bit. And actually, some of the graduate students in computer science take care of this course. Uh, but then when we thought about teaching this to undergrads, uh, I think it's a little bit different. Uh, so, uh, Okay, let me actually go back for a second. You know, if you try to throw all of this um, notation on them, th this is like a alien word for computer science, uh, typical computer science major. I mean, some of them are sophisticated enough and take, you know, take physics and, and take things. I mean, uh, but the typical computer science major, uh, this is not the way they think. And it's extremely uh, technical. I mean, it's very heavy going. And so, uh, I have two ideas, essentially. One is I want to keep them engaged because it's going to be hard work. And two, I want to make sure I relate, uh, I use their intuitions and what they already know to develop new skills. So the first one uh, is uh, 
uh, just like a quote I, I, I like a lot from uh, a paper uh, that one of my colleagues here showed me, that if you want the students to learn, you just have to make sure you have a strong emotion in them. Uh, so we don't want to, you know, get them upset or anything or bored, but so we want to keep them in awe. So we started the course with this wonderful paper. It's, a, it's the paper that I have on the right here, the quantum mistress for anyone. It's a paper that's like three pages. Uh, it has no equations, no symbols, uh, and it's a little like puzzles that you can read in the newspaper maybe. Uh, it has uh, an experiment that it explains and this experiment uh, defies everything we believe about uh, our understanding of reality. Uh, it defies your common sense, your logic, uh, and it's an experiment you can do. And we will actually show uh, later in the course how to do this experiment. We start, we tell the students, read this paper. Uh, we discuss it in class a little bit and uh, we explain what the experiment is doing and we get them to uh, think about it. And then there is an assignment uh, on reflecting on this experiment. And uh, see, these are quotes from the students from their, uh, uh, the first assignment uh, that they realize that there's a new way of thinking about what's happening and that what they think they understand is not exactly you know, accurate. Uh, it's actually missing something fundamental. And I think that keeps them, and we always keep, as the course gets going and we have, you know, things get tedious, we always go back to this and kind of remind them of you know, the big picture here, that we're trying to, uh, uh, we're addressing something that is uh, just completely new and requires a new way of thinking. And this is what we want them to get out. We want to get out of this course, a new way of thinking about uh, computing and about logic and about reality in some sense. Okay, so we kind of established this off. Then we kind of look, okay, what do the students know? The typical computer science students, uh, well, they all are excellent programmers and, you know, uh, so we can, try to uh, use programming skills. They, uh, they know digital circuits by numbers, truth tables, gates, they know the, all of this stuff. They've all taken discrete math, so they know sets and counting, probability theory, you know, some, I don't think they've taken in-depth uh, probability theory typically, but they take some. Algebra is mixed. Some people, uh, I mean, they take calculus, they take, uh, um, uh, finite math and so on, but you know, advanced algebra, vector spaces, not all. Some yes, some no. So how do we start with that uh, group? So we're going to start programming because I think that's the uh, the kind of the thing that they can relate to the most. And then we also want to focus on uh, like skills. So we want to make sure that if we're going to teach them something, that they practice it a lot and a lot, and they practice it in context. So there is um, some engaging activity where they have to use that skill as opposed to just giving them fact after fact after fact. So, you know, programming. So we're using Qiskit, like uh, I think many people, and I think quite a few talks following this one are going to talk the details of Qiskit. So I'm not going to talk too much about the details. I'm just going to show you what we're doing uh, briefly. So this is like after that first paper with Norman, the next, uh, you know, uh, second week immediately, we start writing code that's on the left here. So they can handle that. I mean, this is very uh, simple for them. It's like, okay, you have, um, uh, you know, some uh, declarations at the top for how many registers you want, and then you have some uh, uh, initialization, and then you apply some operations, you know, CX, CCX, whatever. Uh, and then you can visualize this, you can read about truth tables and they can handle this very quickly, very easily. They can play with it. Uh, and notice that at this point I'm using, if you know what uh, Qiskit, I'm using X, CX and CCX gates, which are all classical. So this is still a classical, I'm using the quantum kind of uh, interface uh, for uh, IBM's uh, quantum computer, but I'm only using the classical subset. And there's, this was intentional that we are starting with classical uh, intuitions because all of this can be done classically. And so we uh, have them uh, take 
uh, classical things, adders, multipliers, majority gates, you know, things that they have studied uh, classically and design them as reversible functions and use facts about permutations. And so we talk a little bit about permutations, about gates and so on, but this is all classical and they can actually, uh, they had like two or three uh, kind of problems here. I'm going to show you like, for example, uh, and exercise, exercises from assignments that they followed. So they can define, design, for example, a five bit ripple adder. They can uh, use uh, facts about permutations to uh, show that certain functions cannot be written or can be written and how to write them. And so they can design and implement, uh, sorry, they can design and implement uh, reversible circuits. Uh, they can use permutations to reason about them. And this is like one step towards quantum computing, but they're completely using their classical intuitions and things they know. And this was this part went very well because they are completely comfortable in that space. But at the same time, they're starting to use uh, the quantum kind of language and notation. Then there is a jump. Uh, we need to introduce uh, parallelism and interference. And for that, we have to talk about complex numbers, vector spaces, you know, products, and you know, uh, and that is a lot of, uh, for many of them, uh, it's something they, they know something about. They know, they know complex numbers, but they're not that comfortable, you know, converting representations, square root of unity. They don't know all of the stuff very well. Uh, vector space, inner you know, products, uh, and so on. Bracket notation is new for them. Uh, and so we spend some time talking about this and spending uh, a lot of uh, exercises, drilling exercises in uh, uh, getting them comfortable with these, these concepts. So they did acquire quite a bit of skills, you know, be really, really comfortable with complex numbers, vectors, superpositions. Uh, they can, uh, you give them superpositions with respect to a basis, ask them, change the basis, is it still a superposition? Uh, connect the, what Gerardo was saying that uh, interference is a classical concept. I mean, waves and water do interference. Uh, so to try to connect uh, this idea with like, uh, again, things they know already. And the punchline of all of this was the Fourier transform that Gerardo also mentioned, because that is uh, something that has interference and essentially nothing else. And then they can actually, uh, what's interesting about this is also that uh, you can understand, get a glimpse of complexity and kind of the power of quantum computing. Because uh, if you present the quantum Fourier transform, sorry, if you present the discrete Fourier transform, it's clear it's a matrix that's n by n. So the obvious you know, implementation would take n squared. If you use divide and conquer, which they know, I mean, this is a classical, kind of idea, you can divide the matrix recursively in two, you can make it n log n. And again, they know that. I mean, this idea of divide and conquer is quite common in computer science. Uh, what is the surprising thing is that you can take this n log n uh, classical solution and you can make it log square n, getting a factor of log n, exponential factor. And this is where they kind of see that the power of interference and uh, quantum parallelism. So this was like an assignment and I kind of put some challenge questions here uh, to see if somebody is engaged enough to uh, go and research this uh, for the long term. So I'm hoping some students will uh, use this and go and do uh, some extra work and maybe some, maybe do some research, independent study after the class or something. Uh, then we just recently had a midterm and again, to, just to show you the skills they have acquired at this point uh, they can, you know, implement and design reversible circuits uh, very well. I mean, that question uh, on top was quite hard. Uh, they can also do things like with superpositions and uh, compare uh, uh, states and detect superpositions, understand when it's superposition and it's basis dependent and so on. So now they are conversant in all of that. So that was, you know, quite pleasant to see. Uh, uh, that they've learned quite a bit of uh, enough skills to be conversant in uh, these uh, concepts. Okay, right now, so the course is ongoing and right now we are uh, doing 
the, the last part, which is entanglement. And again, we are drilling them that entanglement is dependent on the composition of the space. You know, so you can have a big space that has maybe 10 qubits. And if you take the first three as a subsystem and the next as a subsystem, it might be entangled. If you change the decomposition, maybe it's not entangled. And again, they're, we're drilling them into exercises like this. Uh, uh, then we'll, we, uh, this is ongoing now. We'll kind of finish all of the basic uh, pieces of quantum mechanics, which are the measurement, the projection, the probability, uh, so that they can kind of uh, have the whole, uh, all of the pieces. Uh, then, uh, so this is, uh, just to tie it all back, once they know and they've seen all of the gates and they understand entanglement, then we are going to, I mean, this is the next lecture, uh, like maybe in next week or so after spring break, uh, we will go back and present the, what's on the slide here, which is the experiment that we have seen on day one. Uh, this is what it is. You know, it's uh, you know, an entangled pair and then three measurements on the, on the, in three different bases. And then they can run this experiment and they can observe the results, confirm that the reality doesn't work the way they expected. That's kind of one of the uh, nice things about this say is like they have to start thinking differently, different kind of uh, logic, different way of thinking. Uh, and when you look at the code, it's very simple. I mean, I think they can handle this code now if they, once they know uh, all of the pieces. Okay, so this is kind of the wave front of what we're doing. We are, uh, we plan to do some algorithms, talk about various things, computation versus simulation, quantum supremacy. Uh, one of the things I would like to get out of this course is irrespective of quantum uh, computing, whether it happens, you know, uh, maybe it won't happen today or in the next five years, uh, but at least they can even take some ideas of quantum computing and change the way they are thinking, uh, even in classical computer science. The ideas of reversible probabilistic, you know, interference, they can take these ideas and start using them right now. Uh, and this is one step closer to quantum computing and there is something they can do with the current understanding, current tools, current skill set they have. So how is uh, all of that working? Well, uh, I keep following the students. I mean, they are some of the best students and they are quite happy. They are encouraging, they work hard. One of them told me this is the class that uh, in which he's working the most. Uh, I mean, this is always good when you, uh, the students are engaged uh, and motivated to work really hard. Uh, what we also discovered is, uh, I mean, the theory is so beautiful that it's tempting to talk about the theory, but the students, we found that maybe they are not ready to tackle the theory and they don't need to in some sense. What's better is to give them little skills like this, like little uh, understanding superposition, understanding reversible you know, uh, computer, understanding permutation, understanding uh, you know, these little pieces and skills and drill them into those skills. And they are quite enjoying this and developing good intuitions. And finally, we have a colleague, uh, so that my colleagues in physics introduced me to uh, Chris Porter, who is from uh, Ohio State uh, Physics. And he is evaluating quantum mechanical courses, I mean, mechanics courses. He is an expert in that. And he's excited to team with us to kind of uh, evaluate this new, I mean, it's not a quantum mechanics course, but it's a new modality, like it's a new space and so we're getting a formal evaluation uh, from him uh, to see how it works and how best to change or adapt uh, when we offer this next time. So that's, I'm trying to keep it uh, kind of uh, to the point and uh, short, so that's all I have. Uh, and I think we'd be happy to take questions, me and Gerardo. Hi, uh, okay. My name's uh, Fred Martin. I'm computer science person from UMass Lowell. And um, so I'm remembering all my EE stuff. I did a joint EECS undergrad degree, so that's like 40 years ago almost. And I wanted to ask Amir, how, do your students have 
EE background, or um, or and if so, is that relevant to their class, or are they able to do it without such background? Thank you. Uh, thank you. So, uh, so that reminds me of myself too, actually, 14 years ago or something. Anyway, uh, so uh, Indiana University did not have an engineering department until recently, until the last four or five years. Uh, so our students are in computer science that, you know, uh, of course, we do have classes that are uh, what you, the classes you might find in a, in a computer engineering department. Uh, so the you know, they, they, they play with like um, uh, uh, embedded systems and, you know, some digital design and so on. But in fact, the students in the class are not, except for one, there's one student who is in that specialization, the systems, the specialization, but the other ones are not. They are uh, computer science students. They don't really uh, know be, uh, beyond basic circuits and gates, uh, which is what everybody has to take. Uh, basic computer organization, uh, and we're trying to target, I mean, a, a wide audience. So, I mean, that's, uh, we're not trying to, we're not assuming they know much about double E uh, concepts. Thank you. Okay, well, any other questions? So this, uh, yeah, this is the first time. I've taught a grad version before. And it was completely different. Uh, this is the first time to uh, offer this class to undergrads. Uh, and we have, I mean, it's still a small class. We have like 15 uh, or so undergrads, uh, but they're quite motivated. They work hard. And I think uh, so far, I believe it's going to work out. It's, it's success and we'll see how it goes. And, we hope to offer a bigger version next next year once we have uh, Can you ask one more, more. follow-up? So the way you set up, um, they can leverage their programming skills that they definitely have. Um, and as you're showing the examples, there are a lot of proof skills. And that's something that can be channelized as a PFD with that relatively new setup. Um, has that been a challenge for them? So, okay, so, so far, I mean, we have some of the best students, so they can handle it. That's one thing. And we drill them a lot on uh, like the like the math background, uh, so the vector spaces and kind of the probability and the um, the permutations. Uh, but I think that's so. I mean, I guess different students, different audiences. You may uh, you know have a bit more programming, less theory, more theory, less programming. Uh, we're trying to find the right balance, but I think that. Um, the theory is necessary to some extent, and so it's important to have some of it, and the amount certainly will depend on the students. The group we have can handle what we're giving them. Yeah. And maybe if we have a broader, like a bigger class with less uh, excellent students, uh, maybe we'll have to scale down or slow down a little bit. Uh, we'll see how it goes, but so far it seems they are enjoying uh, what we're doing. So I know this is cross-listed with a graduate uh, section. Do you have a lot of graduate students or not at all? No, actually, uh, we actually try to send the grad students to Gerardo's class. We still, we still have one or two, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I have graduate students from, you know, several disciplines, you know, I mean, computer science, um, uh, uh, chemistry, uh, from even history and philosophy of science, uh, you know, from mathematics. And we have undergrads, but the undergrads are from physics. So, you know, physics undergrads is not the same thing uh, because they have this background. So the math and, you know, the physics background required is there. So th we don't have that challenge. I see. So my, my, my question was related to the fact that, um, so it seems that this 400 level course is just undergraduates. If it were to be, cr which it is, cross-listed with graduate sections, then graduate students in the course could act some sort of catalysts and sort of coordinate or di direct the undergraduates. But it looks like this is a, just a pure undergraduate course, the 400 level, correct? Essentially, yeah. We have, uh, I think there's one or two grad students. And there's also someone from engineering who sits on the course. I mean, there's like other people who are interested, but the bulk of the class uh, is the undergrads. Okay. 
Okay, so it looks like so this is it. Thank you so much. We're going to. Oh, by the way, I would like to add one thing sure. because I didn't mention, but there is something that I'm going to implement uh, next next year. That is, uh, I am going to I'm going to uh, you know the department uh, bought a kit, okay, an experimental kit, and I am going to uh, take the students to the lab. Uh, a few times, and I am going to perform experiments, uh, essentially quantum teleportation, uh, 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 bell measurement of bell inequalities, and uh, things like that. Uh, 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 in you know, experimentally. So I am going to show them that what they are doing, you know, with the computer is something that you can see, see using your hands. Okay, and that's very important because this looks like science fiction. Okay. Uh, uh, but if you see it in the lab, and it's very easy to do. Those kits are expensive, but, uh, but they are extremely useful. Uh, that, that changes the whole thing. Wonderful. Okay, so once again, thank you so much for the presentation, for the joint presentation. <laughs> so now we're going to take a five minute break and then we're gonna connect with um, Eric um, EJ Johnston who wrote this book. And, um, and then the first person who asked a question of EJ, he's gonna have two presentations. The first part is, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll explain when we introduce him. So five minute break and then we'll come uh, back to this. Thank you so much, Gerardo and Amr. Thanks. We're gonna take a break, Eric, I mean EJ. Yep.